Uh, today we have Jim Stiff with us. Uh, Jim is CEO and chair of Petco Corporation. And we are very concerned about America, especially in terms of the basic principles that are used in how businesses operate. And one basic principle relates to economic viability. And uh, Petco Corporation is a good example of an organization that has this embedded uh, principle. And Jim, looking at this, I want to ask you first about consumers. Uh, how does your company view consumers in terms of this uh, cutlery product that you manufacture? Well, consumer is one of our very key stakeholders. I know as we go through this, we'll talk about stakeholders. Certainly, consumer becomes a very, very important one. Without consumers, there are there is no business. And as such, then, the key is that we have a product that we can take care of the consumer with, that we can be proud of, and we have a forever guarantee on those products. So we talk about the consumer. Uh, we're going to take care of that product, whether it's your grandmother's product. If she bought the knives and you have them, there's a problem. We're going to take care of that. Free lifetime resharpening. Uh, continually working with our, our customer service folks as to, as to how we can do uh, a much better job, how we can exceed expectations every time we deal with customers. And, uh, and customers is what it's all about. Now, once you have a customer, then there's other questions, but the customer is the most important element in a business. If you have no customers, you have no business. There are very few firms with a forever guarantee, right? I, mean, this is I don't know that I know of any, quite truthfully. <laughs> uh, it's uh, once some people look at it and say, you, you got to be kidding, you're not really doing that. Anymore. But it, it really is. It is it is our advertising. We're in direct sales. Uh, and so we don't do a lot of advertising. What we what we deal with is a lot of word word of mouth and personal convictions of the product. And it's that it's that lifetime guarantee, that forever guarantee. It really does it. You know, we get a young sales rep that goes up to a home and says, uh, "This is cut cool. and, and then we say, "Oh, oh yes, I I love it. I, I, I sent some I sent a knife back that was 25 years old, and I just thought they'd blow us off. And next thing I know, a brand new knife goes in the house. So uh, one, it's great for the sales force. It's great for the customer, and, and word of mouth is the best advertising we have. Uh, getting people who are just really uh, psyched about your product and your background and who you are, and what we're all about. And that forever guarantee is, is just very crucial for that. Also. And the bottom line, you deliver value. We for deliver people. value. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's not, uh, we're not sending products to go to the landfill. Mm -hmm. These will be the last knives you buy. And maybe your kids, to could pass them on. Uh, so, uh, and hopefully you'll have some new sets for your kids, but, uh, but no, this is, uh, this is the last product you're buying. And it's value, uh, it comes with it, it's that forever guarantee, it becomes the relationship with the factory. Very few places you can buy a product and you're dealing with the factory. Uh, you're dealing through some middleman somewhere where you're dealing directly with the factory here. And, uh, and we have a free resharpening, lifetime free resharpening. You send it back and the knives are completely resharpened and it handles the polished stuff. You get your knives back and they're like new and good to go. And you maybe need to do that every seven, eight, ten years. So but that's, we'll do that forever. Well, I've often heard that uh, if you're going to take care of your uh, customers, you've got to take care of your employees because that's the backbone of best quality products. So how do you view employees? Well, we, we've we always had great employees. Uh, we are a, a very closely held private company, uh, which became uh, happened in 1982. Company was started in 1949. So we're 63 years old, but at 82, uh, we did leverage buyout management team from the uh, from Alcoa, and part of that proposition of doing that, of having the opportunity to buy that, was the fact that we had a great relationship with our employees. Now it wasn't always so. Uh, I came in 1975, and I was there for three months and went through a strike, a six-week strike, and that was the fourth strike in a row, coming off every three years of a contract. Uh, we have not had a strike since 1975. Uh, Eric Lane came in in 1977 as president. Uh, we made a commitment that says, this is no way to run this business. You have to, we have to get the employees on their side. And we started working with them. We, uh, we didn't buy them out. We did good things. We didn't buy them off with contracts. We, we had contracts that were respectable, good for everybody. They were win-wins. And, uh, and we got to know the people, and they got to know us. We were family. And so when 1982 came around and said, here's this opportunity to buy this company, we'd already built a relationship. The people were there with us. Uh, 
and that was a big part of doing this. In fact, we knew we had good workforce, and they were behind us, and they were motivated, and we had them around. If we had a tremendous labor problem, it probably would have said that you cannot take this risk. This would have been a very big risk. But in fact, it was the people that were working said that allowed that to happen. And I'm going to tell you, when we went from publicly held to private though, they stepped it up about five times on, on how they were behind us and understanding the problems. When you belong to a multinational corporation and you try to talk about profit being important, uh, it, it gets lost because people just look at it and say, well, the corporation has lots of money. Why is it important? Well, we know in business, the corporation isn't looking at what the corporation has as a whole. It's what is your business doing? And our business was struggling, but it was hard to understand. Once we owned it, and then when we talked about the bank now, it wasn't talking about Alcoa. It was talking about the bank. And, uh, and that became very important. They got it, and, and they became part of the team of how we work together, and we just have a, a wonderful relationship. It's part of what drives me is uh, I love working with people and, and the opportunity to, to work with people who want to work with us. And it's been a lot of fun. So the backbone is loyal employees. They'll do anything uh, that they can do to support the company. They will do the things that and, need uh, to be done and keep the product right. Because once you start to cut corners, the employees don't care about it. Right? That quality isn't going to be augmented. You know, especially when your uh, product is so labor intensive as ours. Uh, you need to have the employees that care about the product and care about what's being done. And care about the fact that they want to be here 20 years. They're not just looking at a paycheck for the next couple months and they're going to go on. They, they're looking at careers. They want to retire from this company. And they know that isn't going to happen if the company goes under. And they're, and they're a part of that. They're not the only part. We have to sell the product. Everybody has a role in this. But the employees have a very important role. And uh, it's just good for everybody. I mean, it's just it, it's it's easier for me to go to work when I have a relationship with employees. If I go to the work thinking I'm going to be in battle all day, it, it gets to be the point where you just say, well, let's just hang it up. I, I don't need to work. I can go on and go do something else. But uh, it's thinking about the employees what makes you go. The employees think about the customers. And, and we think about the customers the same way. It's how do we how do we take care of the customers? How do we take care of the employees? How do we take care of our independent contractors? How do we sell them? Well, in terms of economic viability, uh, there's another stakeholder, and that's your suppliers. And I've heard some very good things about your relationship, uh, especially in New York, with uh, a number of suppliers. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Well, we are, and I guess we we kind of got to this on our own. Uh, it became they become buzzwords on, on supplier loyalty and partnership and all this. We had just kind of gotten there without any particular big business plan, but it was the fact it was the right thing to do. If you're going to do business, uh, and if it can't be a win-win, you can't beat your suppliers up to lose. If they can't win, you won't win in the end. And so early on, we said we are partners in this, and how do we work together? Uh, if you're having problems, let us know. If we're having problems, let you know. Let's work through it together, and we'll make a great thing out of this. And and then shopping at home, as of course, as much of it has become uh, international inflow. And, and I'm a manufacturing guy by, by nature. I'm an engineer, uh, and so I'm a, I bleed manufacturing, and it's very painful to see what's happening in manufacturing and, and recognizing it is such a vital part of the middle class. I mean, it, it's built the middle class, and tough to think about what's going to replace that. Uh, hopefully we can get some of this back with the economy situation we're in right now or for some opportunities to come back and be competitive. But it's uh, it's it's the backbone. And, and your suppliers are part of that backbone. And if what you're doing is changing your supplier uh, on pennies, uh, then uh, you don't have a good viable, you don't have a good viable strategy. Your strategy's got to be that the, you have to have those suppliers do the same thing for you as your employees do. They want to lay down and die for you. And you want to lay down for your suppliers. And now you're in this, and it's a team play. All stakeholders are involved, and they're all going to work hard to make it a success. There are no guarantees, but I assure you, if you don't have people working together and rowing in the same direction, the success is almost impossible. But at least if everybody's trying, people are working together, suppliers are working together, they understand what you want, you're being honest with them, you know, it makes a good thing. And then shopping at home, we're in a, we're in a 16,000 community, rural western New York, small northeast west uh, New York towns or the, the rust buckets industry has left uh, it's tough and trying to get people to stay there and shop even for our own employees to say well it, it's like drug plants we just went through one on uh, we're south insured and what they want you to do is do the insurance companies will say uh, go do the mail-in drug plant 
you know, and he was saving a few bucks. Well, the bucks is really pretty small. But in the end, uh, we spent $1.3 million in pharmacies growing cold storage before he helped us. If we take, uh, if we took $900,000 out of the local community of pharmacies, that's big. And pharmacies are good jobs. Or pharmacists are good jobs. So you have to look at it as the point is, you know, we can, we can cut the pennies here to save. But if what we end up doing is losing and having all these empty stores money, people don't want to live in the community anymore. It's not exciting to live there. So you need to keep some viable businesses there, too, even if you pay a little bit more for it. Not in, not an outrageous amount, but you can pay a little bit more to stay local because they're also paying taxes. And if you have nobody else paying taxes, you're going to pay them all. So I'd rather have some partners out there with businesses and, uh, and making the town look nice that we can do that. So we're trying to find ways that, that we can do that. We, uh, we uh, on Christmas, uh, we always have some type of Christmas gift. We do have a profit sharing program, which a lot of us say, why do you do Christmas gifts? We pay those trucks out at the same time, and they're always pretty big. But uh, we do a Christmas gift, and we've done all kinds of things. But several years ago, we went to a grocery store uh, $100 gift card. Uh, and part of that was uh, two things. One is it was something that would say it would hopefully go to groceries, which is the thing that people need. But two was, the card was at a locally owned grocery store. And we did it just at the time that Walmart was opening their superstore. Okay. And knew they were going to take this, this local store was going to take a pound. So we thought, well, one is it was an opportunity to put some business there. But two was that there's probably some of our employees that have never been in that store. So maybe if they went in the store to use their $100 gift card, they might find it's a nice store. And they do some shopping there too, that, uh, that we don't run out to locally owned guys. But, you know, locally owned guys are the ones who support the baseball teams and do this and, and, and volunteer for that. These are the people who have a stake in the community. And, and we try to uh, encourage our employees to, to do those things. And, and they follow through, and they're happy that we're doing it. They're, they're kind of excited when they hear that we're doing that, that we're, that we're encouraging people to shop at home, shop in, in the state, you know, made in America. You know, spend, your money, spend your money at home, and maybe that's got a chance to build some jobs, and that'll build security for yourself. Well, you know, I think there's very few companies that have this vision of community like you do. But obviously, you're you're looking at your employees, and they have a big impact locally. But then you view the community beyond that. I mean, even your suppliers are viewed as part of this uh, at least regional community. And then you expand it beyond that to uh, made in the U.S. a uh, community of uh, economic viability of our nation as well as just the local area. You have to stand forward and play a role. I mean, you can talk about it, but if you don't take a stand and start to do some things. Now, I will say, we do buy a few products in China. But what they are is some products that we find that we don't make. Uh, and we weren't able to find a U.S. supplier. We'd love to have everything come from a U.S. supplier. We just recently went through uh, a horrific circumstance to where we were in the flatware business. We had beautiful stainless flatware. Uh, and uh, we had had some other stainless flatware that we were sourcing from Korea because we don't make fortunes from it. But we already had the knives. But then we wanted, and those were with the, uh, had the plastic handle on it. And then we thought, well, we had a great line that could be solid stainless, but we couldn't do it because we couldn't make the knife. And we will not make, what we've said is we will not buy knives offshore. Our knives have got to be made in America and basically got to be made by us. So we found a way to where we could make the knife. And in the process of trying to make the knife, we found a company, it was called Cheryl Manufacturing. It was uh, in the old factory, the old Nida Silversmith uh, Flatware Company. When they went bankrupt, they bought the facility. Same thing we kind of did back in 1982 when we bought the company from Alcoa. And they were trying to make a go of that. And they actually priced the product, said, you know, we can make the fork and spoons for you too. And they actually were competitive with China. And so we said, great. So we had all this American made flatware. And we pulled our plastic handle running that we were doing the assembly in the States. We pulled the whole thing back. Unfortunately, I guess this was a case where being competitive with China uh, killed them because they went bankrupt last September. And so now uh, we bought about a half a million dollars of equipment from them so we could do the knife. So we're actually making the knife in our factory now, totally. But the fortune spoons, it isn't that we couldn't make them, but we cannot make them at, at economically at all. It's just not, not our thing. So we're buying the fortune spoons actually in Mexico of which we, uh, it's in an old Oneida factory in Mexico, so somebody down there bought an Oneida factory, so they're making them to our quality and our spec. But it's in Mexico now. We'd much rather have them made in the United States. We kind of weighed that out and said, what we think we'd like to maybe buy them in Mexico, 
better than buying in China, because at least we're still in North America. I mean, and uh, you know, we, there's a whole other story there to talk about whether you're talking about immigration or not. But the fact is, we're we're kind of all on this continent, and uh, how can we do things together here uh, to do that? So we are doing that. We we do get some people that uh, complain. They get the nice to see Mexico on that, and, and nobody and they're disappointed. Nobody's more disappointed than we are. We'd like that to say United States, but there is nobody in the United States now that makes pork since when it was flat. And we think what we're at, where's the last person making a hollow candle cake at the same table at Cutco Factory? There is nobody else. So that whole industry has been lost. So here's cases to where uh, we said we're gonna we're gonna do it, we're, and we're gonna we're gonna keep this thing. We're we're committed. Our to our people says we we might buy a few things, but we're gonna make knives. The knives Cutco knives are made. In and you're helping the viability of NAFTA, the idea that Canada, the U.S., well, and Mexico can, you know, yeah. share. We wish there was more things we do buy a few things from Canada. We wish there was more. We can take, actually, the ice cream scoop was one that we ended up going to China, but uh, we worked real hard at it. We were looking at a company in Quebec that was, we hope we were going to get to on that. We just didn't get there, but uh, it is. I mean, I guess we just look at it and say, um, however you want to look at your political situation, but the fact is, we are all on this continent. And if they don't have the jobs down there, they're going to come here. People are going to look for jobs to take care of their families. And so I guess in that regard, if at least if we can buy the flatware in, in Mexico, and we can make a lot of knives, but we'll make the knives here in our factory in Olean, then uh, that was the next best decision. Hopefully, some way, Cheryl will find a way that maybe they can start the business back up and we can make it again in the United States. But uh, it's a real disappointment to us. We were excited when we were making all that flatware. Well, we can, uh, you know, take care of all of our uh, stakeholders, but then there's the bottom line. And if you're looking at true economic viability, there has to be a bottom line. And many of the things you're talking about relate to that, don't they? They do. And I think part is that if you look at it really from an accountant's view, you can say that, well, it, it, you just got to cut costs. If you cut costs, you'll create a problem. Well, you can do that in short term. Like you talk about employees, you can try to beat the, uh, you can beat wages down, and you can make more money, but you won't last very long because you're going to have such a uh, horrible circumstance between the employee management relations and that that you're you're going to be spending money in other areas. So if you can have people happy, they're going to work harder naturally. You don't have to go out and watch them and, and put timekeepers on them. Uh, they're going to do it. And we're and we're a profit sharing company. We have a profit sharing unilateral. It's not in our union contract. It's a unilateral product that we put in, and and they'll do those things. But you have to have a profit, you're right. I mean, if you don't have profit, these other things will not happen. We couldn't have gone to Cheryl and bought a half a million dollars of equipment if we had no profit. So it gave us the opportunity to make that advancement for our employees to create those jobs in old hands. But then it comes down to the question, how much profit is necessary? Um, and it's not the only thing, but it is very important. So we look at it as a balance of the total use of stakeholders, taking care of your customer properly, taking care of your employees properly, Taking care of your community properly, taking care of your sales work properly. If you're doing all those things, our philosophy is then you have a chance to be successful. And and, and making a profit is one of them. If you make no money, then you clearly will. You can't last very long with no profit. Profit is important, but it's not the only thing. Uh, there are a lot of other important things. And again, it makes life more valuable when you know what you're doing for. You're not just going for the money. Uh, we could sell our business. And make a lot of money. The owners can make a lot of money. At the end of the day, it's only money. And money can't give you end to happiness. End happiness is the fact that you've got a lot of good people that you know are working with you, and you've helped a lot of people. Uh, that goes a lot farther. I mean, once you can put food on the table and do some of those basic things, it's, uh, and there are other things more important. And the people become more important. And community becomes more important. And other businesses. I mean, how we can help them. And uh, you know, St. Bonaventure University in our community. It's a 2,000 uh, student university. I just went on the board of trustees about a month ago. And part of that is one is I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not a graduate of that, but I, we're, we're very fixed on the fact they're very important. They're a very important element to our community. One is they bring a lot of outside dollars in with the students that come. Two is they're a very big part of our brain trust of the community. All the professors and all that. They, we're in a small rural community where most of the companies that are owned by outside uh, on outside only in other states, the executives don't live there anymore. So you completely you don't have this whole group of people. And I look at it and says that 
bond of interest are important as us as we are to them. And so it's uh, how do we work together to uh, to do those things to make that work. And, and that's a win-win circumstance you can get. If they would leave all in, it would be devastating. It would be. And small, as you know, small colleges, it's, I mean, that's a that's a tough battle today. I mean, they're all businesses. They are a business. I know a lot of times colleges don't like to think of themselves as business, but if you're in the business side of the college, you recognize it is. You have to market yourself. You have to find students. You have to create value. And if you do those things, you have a chance to stay in business. Yep. Every organization has a bottom line, but Every organization has a bottom line. And if you don't have a bottom line, if your bottom line is red, you don't have an organization very long. So at the end, you have to keep all things in balance. It's a balance, uh, balanced life. Well, Jim, I don't think we could have found a better company to illustrate this uh, economic viability principle because you've embraced every aspect of it. And we sincerely want to thank you for joining us today and sharing uh, the mission, vision, and philosophy uh, of uh, Petco Corporation. Thank you. I hope that can be uh, a part that can help you with some, some other people. I mean, we're passionate about it, but it's, it is a passion that keeps me getting up in the morning and going to work. So, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you.